So now there's a bunch of people that are homeless in our, in our larger department. And if you want to bring one of our... What I'll probably do now is go blank or yeah, black everybody. and I'll mute, yeah, so but I'll keep keep an ear out. Should I, I'm 12 in the waiting room. Should I let people in or give it a few more minutes? Double digits now, okay. Yeah, I mean, what? What about the CIB old uh, Congress courts? Up to you guys, I'm good any time. Yeah, okay, I'll let them in and then I'll just keep an eye out for others. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. We've just, uh, we're still just waiting for some more people to join. So if we could just hang tight for a few more minutes, uh, we'll get started. Oh. 
Okay, so I've been told it's almost 7.05 and I think um, many of the people have been let in from the waiting room. Uh, good evening, I'm Cindy. I'm uh, part of the education committee. And so um, I'm gonna hand it over to Pierre and he's going to introduce our speaker this evening. Oh, actually, can I do the land acknowledgement first? Oh, sorry, first? Judy, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, Judy. <laughs> Uh, the Artist Network and the Leslie Grove Gallery acknowledge the traditional territories of the Anatnashbe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat peoples. These territories are the enduring home to many First Nation, Métis, and Inuit peoples from across Turtle Island. We also acknowledge that we are hosted on land covered by Treaty 13, held by the Mississaugas of the Credit. Toronto is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, which bound the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee peoples peacefully share and protect the lands of the Great Lakes. In the spirit of this covenant, we're grateful to be able to meet, create, and grow together in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect on this ancestral land. Thank you, Judy. And before I forget, if anybody has questions throughout, uh, feel free to put it in the chat box. I'm going to be monitoring that. Or if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question directly, that also works as well. So off to Pierre. Thank you, Cindy. And it's my pleasure to also have been part of the education committee of the Artist Network to help hold this whole thing together. And I'm uh, just super pleased to introduce Ben Leach to everyone. I can just read uh, something here. Finn Leach joined the Art Gallery of Peterborough as curator in 2014, where her responsibilities include the development of exhibitions and educational programming, management of the permanent collection, and participation in the city's public art initiatives. From 2011 to 2014, she was director of Peterborough's Artist Run Center, Art Space, which I think is one of the oldest in the country. Anyways, that's besides the point. Where she was responsible. Oh, shoot. Media Lab and Center. Past board experiences include the Artist Run Center's Collectives Ontario, the Arts, Culture, and Heritage Advisory Committee, Electric City Culture Council. She has participated extensively in community work juries and conferences regionally and nationally. Finn has an MA in visual culture and a BAH in art history from Queen's University. And I'm really pleased to, well, I can just say I, I got to know Finn, I think it's just over 10 years ago, when I, he was working as a freelance writer and uh, she wrote the essay for a catalog uh, that I was, part of a show, uh, a two-person show at the Art Gallery of Peterborough. And I was amazed at, at Finn's writing skills. It's something I don't possess and uh, just amazed at that. And we've just collaborated over the years on various things, but the latest thing we've been working on, and this is for the last two years so far, um, it's, a, it's a project I've been interested in and, and Finn and I have talked about, but we've only recently nailed down the date of next year for the exhibition. Um, so really this has been almost, it will have been a, about a three year conversation that we've uh, engaged in back and forth. And I can just say it's, it's a, what, a, what a pleasure to work with, but also what a wonderful opportunity as an artist to be able to have an exhibition at a public gallery because it's allowed me, I'm doing some work which I, are, is might be called experimental, but they're thoughts and ideas that I've been playing with. And this allows me to basically, I'm, I'm not even thinking of the commercial aspect of my And uh, we're next, uh, between now and next May when it opens, uh, Finn and I will be working on choosing artworks and stuff. I even do things she hasn't seen yet. So this is going to be exciting. Uh, all that to say, what a pleasure it is to, to know Finn and what a pleasure it is just to introduce her. And I'll just turn it over to you, please. Thank you, Finn. Thanks, Pierre. Um, 
Yeah, I always forget that I was freelance when we first met and worked together. Um, so, so interesting. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I've got a presentation um, and some slides. As Cindy mentioned, please feel free to um, jump in at any time and ask questions. My style um, is fairly free flowing. So I've got a basic structure, but I've got I've, I'm really happy to, to answer questions. Um, and if something comes forward that I know is going to come up in a little bit, I also have no problem just saying like, oh, great question. That's going to come up in a little bit. So don't, don't worry um, or feel like you're going to throw me off. I'm really happy for this to be conversational. Um, one thing that I think is uh, important to me about um, this type of thing is sort of I don't know if it's like erasing some barriers or pulling back the curtains or unveiling um, or demystifying, I guess, some of the things about uh, public institutions. So, um, yeah, really happy for this to be conversational. Bear with me while I share my screen. Okay. I think. It's happening. Great. I see a I see a helpful nod from Cindy. Thank you, Cindy. <laughs> Thumbs up. Okay, so as you all know, because you did the diligent thing and you signed up for this workshop, today's session is called From the Studio to the Institution, Exhibiting in Public Galleries. Um, and yeah, Pierre approached me and asked, um, if if I'd uh, speak to this topic, I think here maybe you've been in the room where I've done some of some version of this talk through the years. Um, I know that uh, that I've uh, that I've um, sort of tried to speak to this um, from a couple of different roles throughout my. Um, I'm not going to say long career, moderately sized career. Um, but yeah, as Pierre mentioned, uh, why would you want to be here? Why would you want to um, exhibit your work in a in a public institution? Um, there are a couple of uh, a couple of opportunities that it provides you. Of course, it's an opportunity to share your work with with a large and perhaps just different audience. Maybe it's not even a larger audience, but a different audience. And again, for the sole purpose of sharing art with the support of an institution. So. Maybe it's not uh, going to be incredibly commercially successful for you, but um, but maybe as as a thing that happened in your career, it will end up supporting other aspects of that career, opening you up to making work that you um, feel perhaps held back by or back from, um, and. Even just the opportunity, I think, to uh, to work with a curator can perhaps um, help you to see your own work in new ways and push you to new spots. Um, so yeah, uh, I had a couple of notes here that I, you will, uh, if you'd like, uh, be able to receive a, a PDF. I've written out a couple of my notes and I will be um, sending that forward to Barb who will then, I'm sure, diligently share it out with all of you. Um, and I wanna note that you know, one of the one of the differences of, uh, of working with a public institution is that, that in, those institutions often have um, various priorities. Um, support for artists and their artwork is always top of mind, but of course they have other obligations to their funders, to their audiences, um, to their budgets, and all of those things shape what and how they do the things that they do and what they are and aren't able to do. Also, I've noted you're not in full control and that's a good thing. Um, Unlike uh, uh, when you're doing a studio tour or um, you've got access to a rental space or you're in, um, I don't know, a show where you've, got, where you've got a space that you can do anything you want with. A lot of the decisions about um, promotions, uh, perhaps even final installation layout decisions, um, 
when it when it happens, um, those kinds of things are often driven by the institution. But what that what that does is it takes a lot of things off your to do list, and it takes a lot of those things off your budgets. And also, um, don't forget when you're when you're entering into a relationship with a curator, and we'll talk a lot about this later. This is just kind of a general overview. Um, that curator has worked with that institution for a long time. So they know things about their audience and they know things about their space that you might not know. What you're coming to the, to the relationship with is that you know your work better than the curator knows your work. So it's about bringing those two things together um, for mutual benefit and figuring out what the best end result is. I don't know, I just like, I like comics. I don't know if this is going to be helpful to you, but I hope you find something, um, something, some nugget that is useful um, that that sort of rattles around either in the front or back of your brain that you can refer to, and um, and hopefully it it offers some what you feel like is positive guidance. It's all super scary to move your work from a studio out into the public sphere. Um, I do think it's a it's a it's a really valid and worthwhile risk. So, as Pierre noted, um, I started my professional getting an actual check for the work that I do career at ArtSpace, and prior to that, I was doing freelance. I did some freelance writing, and I was doing some freelance um, education and engagement programs, and also some freelance curatorial work. Art space, um, yes, one of the oldest artist-run centers in Canada, if not the world, is what <laughs> their slogan at one point said. Um, and I'm just going to briefly talk about um, the ways that uh, exhibitions occurred in art space, um, and then I'm going to spend more time uh, thinking about sort of like the the institutional galleries, which I would consider ones that have probably larger budgets, but I think it's really important to understand how to access these spaces as well, or one of the ways that you could access these spaces. Um, Artist-run centers are, are great spaces, member-driven spaces, as y'all probably know, great spaces. Um, yeah, so I was at ArtSpace. I started late in 2010 as, um, I think I was like programming coordinator, programming director, but then fairly quickly uh, became the only employee. And so I was started out as the executive director and, um, and then just, you know, really quickly sort of asked the board, can we drop the word executive for my title? Cause it just doesn't feel, doesn't feel right. Uh, when you know I'm, I'm also cleaning the toilets, and let's be let's be real about that. Sure, I'm the director, but executive. I mean, we're not that fancy. So, uh, so director was uh, my title for the bulk of my time there. Um, and then uh, 2014, summer of 2014, moved over to the Art Gallery of Peterborough, where I still am, and I can't believe it's been like six years. Feels like it's gone so fast. Um, so in both places, though I'm the curator at, um, at the Art Gallery of Peterborough and I was for the bulk of my time at ArtSpace, the, the only employee, um, still I would say all sorts of things fall within my, within my job description. Um, so the only thing that I want you guys to remember in that is really it comes up later when curators are slow to get back to you, it's probably because they're busy with all of this crap and not because they're uh, not very interested in building a relationship with you and finding out more about your work. Um, so the way that ArtSpace um, selected its exhibitions was in a really um, sort of specific way. There's lots of spaces that still do this. I don't actually think that ArtSpace still does this, but this is what it was prior to me being there while I was there, and I think for a period of time afterwards. So annually, we had a call for submissions, and we'll talk about calls for submissions later. Um, and then I would, as staff, 
process those applications and create a jury package. I would also select um, some people to sit on the jury. Um, and I was really careful to create a mix of people who were, um, while they were sort of peer arts professionals, um, were local, but also I invited always somebody from out of the, uh, outside of the, of the city. Then um, I would supply those, those jury members with access to the packages and some direction. We would look through those all ahead of time. Um, it was usually a pretty big job because we would get well over 100 applications every year. And then um, we would meet with those committee members um, in person uh, for, usually it was two days, usually it was a solid weekend. And, um, and it was, yeah, two long days with, uh, with food brought in. We would go through, make some top choices and um, sleep on it, and then make a final list of, uh, of selections. And then it would be my unfortunate job to send rejection letters, uh, but then also my fortunate job to schedule in those exhibitions and begin those conversations with those, um, those artists. So this is just looking more specifically at what the jury process looks like. Um, it's, it's a multi-level process looking at uh, uh, try, trying to think towards a diverse um, body of exhibitions on the other side, representing a variety of materials, trying to take into account that uh, audiences don't only like one thing. So it's important for, uh, for the gallery to make sure that it's, uh, unless it's a medium specific space, not only show photography, um, also, it's trying to think about um, is there is there are there some overarching themes that are showing up throughout throughout these ap applications again and again and again. Maybe there's something going on in the contemporary arts world um, that needs to be represented. Making sure that that those kinds of I guess zeitgeists are um, are being supported, and also making sure that we've got some diversity in the artists that we're representing. So again, quite different. Now at the Art Gallery of Peterborough, um, we have a dedicated curator. That's a very different thing than being a director. We do have an ongoing call. Um, I do studio visits. I also approach artists. Sometimes uh, I'm the first point of contact or the first person who reaches out. Maybe I've um, noticed your work out in a space. Um, and then when it comes down to it, there's, there's some differences as well in, in uh, the ways that that exhibition actually manifests based on the kind of institution that it might be. So at ArtSpace, the artist and I, and maybe a couple volunteers would um, put the whole thing up together. Budgets were really tight. Uh, if somebody was able to drive their work to the space, that was great as opposed to at the Art Gallery of Peterborough. I mean, sometimes that happens, but for the most part, we're using proper crates and professional art shippers. Um, there's a quicker turnaround at art space, typically one to two years, as opposed to the Art Gallery of Peterborough, as Pierre noted. Um, you know, it's certainly not atypical for us to have conversations for multiple years before a show happens. I think the current show that's in the space um, is the result of a four-year conversation. Um, and I've got some shows that are five-year conversations. Some that are much shorter though as well. The other thing I'll note is that with the different spaces, you might also get access to higher levels of support. So um, with the art, with a bigger institution like the Art Gallery of Peterborough, they're probably able to produce and deliver more educational programs and engagement programs. Um, potentially they're hosting yourself uh, and somebody else, maybe for workshops, artist talks, tours. Um, all sorts of things. Potentially there's a publication that goes along with it. You'll probably get a better set of documentation out of the larger institution. I think this is for me, um, 
a useful juxtaposition of what the two different spaces um, felt like. And I have to note, I loved them. I love them both. Um, so here's Hazel Meyer installing her own um, plywood basketball hoop. She's standing on a ladder. She's not got three points of contact. She is wearing uh, steel-toed boots, so, so that's great. Um, she's definitely not wearing gloves. Uh, she painted on all the walls and her tools are on the floor. And here, at the, this is a photo from the Art Gallery of Peterborough where we're doing some careful uh, collections management. So uh, we had on this day some staff in to do a condition report on a work that we've got in our collection. They're not even touching the work and they're wearing gloves. They're writing in pencil only. They don't have pen in the space. Um, and yeah, just, just a very different, um, very different level of um, regulations, I guess. And all of those are, are good things. Okay, so I've just described my experience at two different spaces, but really you might be interested in showing your work at any variety of space. And all of those different kinds of spaces have their own slight nuances and different ways of working. What you definitely wanna do before you're approaching each space is think about those spaces. Um, who you might be um, proposing to. Think about how your work might fit into that space. Think about how your practice fits into that organization. I've popped a link here, and again, it's in the PDF, uh, to an older survey done by Carfac. Um, but what they did in that, um, what they did in that um, survey is they talked to tons of spaces, artist-run centers, um, public art galleries, also commercial spaces, a huge variety of spaces, and they surveyed them about what their um, what what it looks like to bring an exhibition into their spaces. So, what their submissions process is like. Um, also, what kinds of supports they tend to give to each exhibition. So, while I'm certainly not saying that this is up to date information, um, it's a pretty useful uh, document. Um, to have a look through and just kind of get a sense of the of the differences. Of course, if you're serious about applying to a space, um, you're going to have to check their website and uh, potentially reach out to them and find out what uh, what their style of receiving applications is now. I definitely remember reading, you know, some slides and things like that in in the 2012 document. As you all probably know, it's all digital these days. It's really rare to see a, a gallery of any sort wanting um, something physical, at least at the first step. Um, seeing something physical later on, absolutely. But as the first step, very unlikely. Um, so when you're trying to figure out from this huge list of possible spaces, where you might want to see your work, I highly encourage you to not apply to somewhere unless you've been there. Um, it's really, I think, useful to physically understand the space um, and get a sense of how that gallery presents artwork. Every gallery space is going to be different. Check out their vibe. Um, also check out their past programming. Is it the kind of space that you see aligning with your practice? If you don't see anything there that you find relates to you and your practice, it's probably not the right space. It's, it's probably not the right space, even in so much as it maybe doesn't know how to show your work. Maybe that's their loss, but keep an eye out for staff changes. That's also something that can change those kinds of things. But yeah, check their websites. Um, and, and that's one of the ways that you can check out their past programs as well. Follow any of the instructions that they've got posted. And remember, you can also reach out and check in. So why it's really useful to follow the instructions that they've got up there is that it's probable that that institution has its own quirky way of working. And that is 
for their administrative purposes, the best way to get something onto um, the right person's desk. Don't forget though, even if that process is like, just put it in here and we'll get back to you and they don't get back to you for a long time, feel free to check in. It's fine. You can totally reach out as well and just call the front desk and say, hey, I was just checking out your website. Is this, uh, is this the best way for me to, um, to submit my work? Okay. Great. And the, the things that all of these spaces are likely thinking about is artistic merit, contribution, relevance, and feasibility. So baseline feasibility, I mean, that's a functional thing. Does the gallery have the right budget to produce this thing? Um, also, feasibility on the other side. Does the, does the reviewer or the gallery perceive that if it's work that doesn't yet exist, that you're actually going to be able to produce that work to the point that you're, that you're saying you are. So feasibility on both sides. Relevance would be about um, relevance to the institution, relevance to the moment, relevance to the artist, or sorry, the, um, the audience, relevance to the, uh, the mandate, uh, relevance to the schedule and the context in which uh, that show might slot in. Or if it's a themed call, relevance to that themed call. It's a really great way. Watch for uh, themed call opportunities or juried um, exhibition opportunities. It's often a great way to get um, a curator to have an initial knowledge of your work. Contribution would be, um, is it making a contribution to the overall project of the institution, which might be like, is it saying something useful? Is it saying something new? And I want to be clear, I'm not discounting formal work in this. Um, I really, you know, I'm really open to formal work and institutions are as well. So it's not that it needs to have some, you know, sociopolitical message necessarily um, for it to have a valuable contribution. I really just had, and I'm going to name no names, and it wasn't peer, but I just had a studio visit with an artist who's going to have a show at the AGP and uh, they were very relieved. Um, it's very initial conversations, but they were very relieved when I was saying, no, 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 I'm not interested in you changing your work and fitting it into some different space in which uh, all of a sudden your abstract practice that is so much about color and shape and line and texture all of a sudden has to have this deeper meaning. No, what you're doing is, is why I'm interested. Um, yeah, so then that potentially brings us to the artistic merit side as well. So the artistic merit and contribution things, I mean, a lot of these are Venn diagrams that overlap a bit. It's difficult to define artistic merit. Of course, these things are all subjective, but artistic merit, is it doing something uh, interesting and valuable? And um, is it going to contribute? Is it, uh, yeah, does it, is, it, is it worthwhile? I don't know. Is it beautiful maybe? Is it, is it doing what it wants to do? Is it um, being, is the artist statement saying, it's, this is gonna, be, it's gonna be ugly and here's why, and then does that work actually do what that artist statement is, uh, is saying it does? So of course, in thinking about getting your artwork out of perhaps smaller spaces or the studio into a public institution, you have to have to have to think about scale, presentation, and intention. Space and scale changes your work, no matter what the medium is. It's a good idea to explore and consider different ways of mounting things, printing things, installing, Oh, good. <laughs> I had my watch upside down. I thought it was eight. Um, different ways of installing your work. Investigate those possibilities. Weigh the costs and decide for yourself. Um, go to those public institutions, multiple different public institutions, and be interested in how things are installed. 
what was the plinth made of? Why was it that color? Did it have an interesting shape? Um, what's going on with that frame? Did they just use magnets? What do those pins look like? You know, any anything. All of that is really useful um, for you to think about when you're thinking about moving your stuff from a studio into a larger space. When you're making big work in a studio, you might have a situation where you're not actually seeing the full finished product uh, until, until it's installed altogether. I mean, I know that's true for sure of the artist that's currently installed at the Art Gallery of Peterborough. A pile of his works um, were only really able to uh, be together as a thing in our space once installed. Up until that point, they were really um, components of, of work. So here's one example of, of how you might occupy space. Think about uh, what, uh, what are all of the possibilities that you wanna use for your work. It might not be that you want to um, have anything to do with the ceiling, but here Diane has, uh, has lit her work in such a way that all of a sudden the ceiling is part of that work as well. Uh, sorry, that's a video that doesn't work very well, but, uh, but also, again, just another example of Diane's work um, using, uh, using shadows cast from her artwork onto, onto a white wall in that gallery space. Dagmar Agenda, different example of um, work that perhaps doesn't even exist until it's installed and doesn't exist afterwards. When this gets uninstalled, it is literally um, garbage, unless it's a raw material for something else. Uh, so think about that, think about how, what does it mean to move your space, move your work into a space in which there are different levels of possibilities, particularly for scale. Intention though, this kind of thing, like blowing your work up to epic proportions might make no sense. Maybe, maybe it's about what, what happens when your work is, is really small. But do think about scale. It uh, deeply affects your work and it's totally different from your, um, your studio space, whatever it is, than in the um, gallery space. So, okay, I'm gonna try and catch up to my notes. So why would you maybe want to show your work in the public institution? We kind of talked about this a little bit and Pierre made some, made some notes about this as well. Um, but yeah, making, making work for non-commercial purposes can actually support uh, your commercial work. It can offer increased profile. It can provide for some collectors legitimacy, can create opportunities for professional documentation and also critical writing. And I don't just mean from the institution, but perhaps, uh, perhaps you know somebody who writes uh, and maybe they could write a review of your work um, and those kinds of things, whether they're published um, in one of our um, national magazines or more locally or on a blog, those things are great, great things for you to have. Um, and they fit really nicely on as links on on a website as well. Um, and yeah, it's also an opportunity to work with a curator. And I think that that can be quite valuable. Um, I hope it's I hope it's valuable. Um, it offers you the chance to have a conversation with uh, with somebody else who's going to see and think about your work in a different way. And they're bringing to the conversation, I think, um, a big interest in what it means when your work goes out into the public. And I, and I mean that uh, in, a, in a sort of metaphorical, like brainy way, but also a really practical way. Um, so thinking through those things with that other person can be, I think, quite valuable for your practice long-term. So typical components of a submission, what, 
do you need to get ready um, and get in there? Cover letter, it's optional, um, but I but I do think it's it's useful to at the very least think about like what what bits of language go there. If it's an email submission, right, you're gonna have to write something in there. Just a little, just a little, hey, like your space. I think we could do something cool together. Check out my work. Um, not all application processes have an opportunity to add in a cover letter, but that's okay. Definitely a proposal, artist statement, bio, CV, documentation, documentation lists, and websites. And I've got in brackets an S there because maybe you use social media as well in a way that you would like those, um, those reviewers to check out. So what is a proposal? A proposal is really different from an artist statement because it lays out the practical aspects of your submission. So um, the sort of like what? This is, this is the really project-based um, stuff. Um, what do you want to do? This is the what do you want to do? A little bit of why comes in here for sure, but this is, this is what do you want to do? Your primary goal for the proposal is to convince the selection committee or the curator that what you do is viable, relevant, and interesting. But also, don't forget that pesky word feasible. So that's where some of that practical stuff comes in. Show me that you're going to be able to do this. If your work has um, a bunch of electronic components in it and you've never worked with electronic components before, are you intending to work with somebody who's an electrician? That's great. Easy. Done. I trust you. The intention of the work should also be explored within the proposal. And as I mentioned, yeah, technical details you may want to, you may want to include. If it's work that's in progress, when do you think, uh, when do you think that work is going to be complete? That's the kind of, that's one of the kinds of things that I would need to know in order to figure out if, uh, if what I'm excited about your work, um, why I'm excited about your work uh, and how I want it to fit into that to my schedule, if those things will will come together nicely. If there's particular equipment requirements that you would be relying on the gallery for, like um, you know reasonable things, projectors, some basic sound stuff, plants, those kinds of things, it's not a bad idea to include that in there. Um, do you expect that if it's more specialized something like you need a very specific TV or tiles, TV tiles, a bunch of iPads? I don't know. Um, it's not a bad idea to say, uh, you know, I think we could probably rent these from, I've got a connection at Ryerson or something. I don't, I don't know. Um, it's, it helps with the feasibility stuff, but, uh, but some basic equipment requirements you can probably rely on the gallery to have or procure that. Um, and uh, yeah, installation proposals. If there's something um, particularly um, different, I guess, about the way that you'd like to install your work, like if, if you have paintings and you want to install them hanging from the ceiling and suspended out from the wall by, by a foot uh, and you want them to be um, backlit, I don't know, um, let me know. An artist statement uh, is different from the proposal because it doesn't need to be as specific and, and functional, right? This is going to be more about your practice uh, in general. Yeah, it's, it's, it, they feel weird, right? Like I, um, I don't know how to tell you to write an artist statement. They're kind of uncomfortable, weird things. Don't, feel like if you're feeling like it's like you're making stuff up don't don't walk away from it maybe you've got a friend who writes and maybe you guys can have a con maybe even like have a friend go out with you for coffee and talk about your work make some notes from that conversation what is it about your practice that you want the curator or the selections committee to know 
go check out other people's artist statements and uh, see what they're writing, see what it feels like. Um, talk to talk to artist friends. I'm sure that you guys are talking about how to write artist statements. Are you struggling with them? I, they're hard. Um, yeah, don't, oh the, yeah. So, so don't hinge your art practice on, on personal catharsis for a public institution. There's something important still about personal catharsis that can connect with a broad audience, but I would, but I think that for the for the public institution, you're going to be approaching that from that higher level thing where you're looking for um, the the general points of connection that uh, a, any human can connect with any other human. This is about a public space. Uh, it's not it's not a private space, right? But your private lives absolutely do fit into that work. <sighs> Tricky. Um, oh yeah, don't over design your submission. This shouldn't really be in the artist statement section, but um, I have received um, submission packages before that have a lot of graphic design going on and that's super distracting. Really, it's about the words and the images of your work or video of your work or sound clips of your work. But yeah, keep the written components really simple and clear. Um, it's just it's just distracting um, and it and it doesn't serve you well. What helps you stand out is writing clearly and to the point and telling me what's going on in your work. Also great photo documentation, but we'll get to that in a sec. Artist bios also weird. Um, they're not they're not artist statements um, and they're also not CVs, but they do pull more from your CV than from your artist statement. So it's an opportunity to position yourself as a professional artist with experience. It often does include, as I mentioned, highlights from your CV, information on where you went to school might be in there, where your work has been shown might be in there, professional um, memberships or associations that you've got. If your work is held in any important collections or private collections, you might wanna note that. Where are you based? Those kinds of things are super useful. Write it in the third person. Um, if you don't, eventually we're going to have to edit it to be in the third person. It's really helpful, um, even though it feels weird to write it in the third person, uh, when you're the reviewer or the curator, you're reading through tons of these bios, and if they all say I, um, it, you've lost an opportunity to remind me of who you are. Okay, so I keep saying CV, difference between a CV and resume. Um, an artist CV is a really specific thing and I've got a couple links. Again, they're in the PDF for you. Um, the resume is gonna get you a job, but the artist CV is a documentation of, um, of your professional work as, uh, as an artist. So one thing to always keep in mind as you're moving through your career is do keep a running list of dates, titles, all of those kinds of things of the stuff that you do. What shows did you show at? Did you sit on a jury? Um, did you, were you a member of something? Were you, there were all of those things are useful. Keep them in a full long list document. You might not use all of those things in your CV because your CV might just be a selection of exhibitions and a selection of um, workshops or artist talks you've given or, um, or workshops, things you've written. Photo documentation, um, I would say photo documentation and the proposal are the most important things uh, when we are looking at your submissions. So documentation is really, really, really important. Um, bad photos, bad photos are just bad photos. And don't forget that like the only thing that I as the curator or the reviewer or the juror or whatever, the only thing that I have is access to what you've given me. So I don't know that um, 
that the photo is uh, not representing your work super well just because, because the, the light was um, a bit dim that day, right? So make sure that you're showing me your work as clearly as you can. Do take photos of uh, of it installed. So, um, and I say somewhere in here that, you know, do take a photo of it, um, of whatever it is. If it's an object, take a photo of it that, that lets me know it's an object. So if it's a painting, take a photo of it that doesn't crop out the full wall. It's really valuable for me to see that painting as, as an object. Um, that's what it is. That's what I want to understand it is. If it's uh, a digital image, different story. Um, feel very comfortable including detail photos as well as, uh, you know, sort of those large scale in installed photos. If you happen to have an opportunity to include a photo that shows some scale, that's, that's helpful. Um, is, is it useful to have a body near your work? useful. But also the back of a person is less distracting than the front of a person. So think about that as well. You do want us to just be looking at your work. Um, the Chanel rule, keep your, uh, your section of documentation focused. So say they've given you an opportunity to share 20 different uh, images of 20 different items. It doesn't serve you well to include images that pull from the full range of whatever styles you've done throughout the entirety of your career when you're wanting to work with me as the artist you are now. I've, I'm absolutely still in support of people showing um, documentation of past work, documentation of past projects, as long as those past projects and past works You've thought through and think that they support your argument for what you're trying to do now. Does that make sense? Um, it's distracting for the reviewer if, um, if we're looking at, at, at everything you've made over the past, I don't know, long time, or if, if we're looking at everything you've experimented with in the, in the past, um, year or two I don't know but but yeah try and keep it a little bit focused um do sort of use um a generous to yourself because everybody's got to be gentle with themselves but but a good strong editor's eye um that's what you do when you decide at the end when, when to finish a painting or when to finish a piece of work that's also what you do when you decide which ones are the ones that you're going to take out to the streets or put up on your website or share in whatever way that you share them. So always make sure that you're continually supporting the intention of the submission. Help me out because um, you're going to be your best advocate. You're always going to be the one that knows the most about your work. And it's, it's very likely that I've never seen your work before. And so I can't bring any of that additional knowledge to reading this submission. Documentation lists. Um, really spend time understanding if that institution has um, laid out any preferred formats or list styles and use every opportunity to share information about each work here. In part, it's this, your documentation list is only gonna be as good as your, as your documentation photos, right? So that's why one of the reasons why you might wanna use details is, is there something within that work that you need to point out? It can also, in your documentation, um, you can also use a small portion of that if, um, if there's something really particular in, uh, in the way that you want to install something, some really particular need um, that you've got in the proposal that you're trying to um, explain, like a particular way that something is framed or, I don't know, um, produced or some sort of specific component. Yeah about mm -hmm. how it's going to be framed or installed. Yeah. Hi, Louise. Oh, sorry. Okay, no question. Um, but yeah, really spend time with that, with that, uh, with any information that they've got about, about um, how to produce a documentation list. 
and use it. Make sure that you're including proper um, measurements. It's really hard to understand scale. Um, installation readiness. Is this something that's just in progress or is it framed and ready to go? Um, the medium, I get when you want, there, there's a real drive to sometimes put uh, mixed media on something, but it is super useful again in that room where I don't have that much information to, um, to expand that medium more. If you want it to just say mixed media, that's totally fine, but maybe use the description to, to pull out a little bit more so that I can understand when I'm, what I'm looking at when I look at a digital representation of that work. Is it that you've got um, paper collage and graphite and pastel and um, I don't know, all sorts of things. Those are really helpful um, bits of information for me. Um, the website. Uh, more and more you're seeing a spot in submissions to include your artist website and potentially social media. Again, it's totally optional, but it is a useful spot for you to provide additional context for your larger practice. Um, and it is also something that is just really good to keep up to date and uh, make sure when you're sending out those submissions, just go on and check and make sure that if you've updated your artist statement and uh, your bio, update it over there too. This is the thing that I constantly reiterate. You know your work in practice better than I, a juror, a committee member, anybody, better than anybody does. So make sure that your submission really clearly tells me what you need me to know. Um, I'm interested, but I've only got what you've given me. And unless you've gotten me to the point where I'm interested, um, we might not have that follow-up conversation that could really, really hook, hook me. I also want to bring up the reality. Um, it's, it's a problem. There's, uh, there's more need for um, space in public institutions than, than we have. Um, so this is just from a typical year of, um, of the sort of spread of applications we get and applications I can say yes to. So what I want to really say is uh, don't feel bad, except for collectively, that kind of sucks. Um, and just know that it's probably not that your work will never get there. It's probably that there was something else going on at that time. And it wasn't the right fit at the exact right moment. When you're working with an institution that has a curator, you can also reach out to that curator, even if they have a submissions process. Um, they may or may not get back to you. Um, it's totally scary to reach out and make a connection to, to anyone, um, let alone somebody that, that might, you know, be the barrier or the, or the door opener to that next, uh, that next spot in your career that you, that you really want. But feel free to do it. And um, I mean, email is a bit cold right now and things can get buried in emails. I do, and you know, you guys are back open. I think we, we are going to be entering a space where, um, where we can get back to meeting and networking in person when there's events show up to those spaces. Um, if it's a small space, you probably will be able to chat with the curator. Um, maybe you'll get some information about what they're interested in. Maybe you'll um, just sort of like begin uh, an open conversation. It's probably not the best time to say, hey, do you wanna check out my work? Here's my phone, let's go through some, some photos. Um, but that beginning conversation and just creating that relationship, that can be really, really important and really crucial because what, what might happen out of that is, is a studio visit. Or, or I might just you know see your name in the submission list and go, oh, I'm gonna check that one out right now. 
Um, also just keep in mind, we're um, under-resourced and overworked. And so if your email gets buried, don't take that as uh, a no necessarily, but do understand um, that, yeah, it's probably the product of, of that. So go to talks, even if they're virtual, we notice names, um, message on, on Facebook or their social media. Um, th those kinds of things are fine too. Again, these are like the beginnings of relationships. Oh, for a studio visit, um, I'm doing, I will say, I will admit as well that I'm doing a lot of virtual studio visits these days. Um, and those are, those are weird, but they're, they're as good as they get sometimes. Um, this, this set of notes is kind of more thinking about uh, in-person studio visits, but the same kinds of things apply. So you're gonna prepare your space and you're gonna pull out some work that you're proud of. Really don't worry about cleaning up. Um, we fully get that this is a, a working space. It should look like a working space. It's, it's fine. I love piles of, piles of artist materials and in progress work. Um, do think about a space where we can sit together, even if that is um, away at a separate cafe or out in a park. Think about somewhere where, yeah, where we can sit and have a bit of a conversation. It's useful if it's in that studio space, but maybe it doesn't work there, that's fine. Um, and do some thinking ahead. What do you wanna make sure that I know about your practice when I leave? What do you wanna ask me? Um, what do you hope I ask you? Because if I don't, maybe you can just share that information. What's your ideal next step? It might not happen, but it's a good idea to think about what, what you hope that looks like. So you're conceptualizing work and then you're applying or reaching out and then you're waiting and it's really nerve wracking and nobody has anything really figured out that's really important to know. Um, I am constantly learning how to do my job and you know, in your practice, you're constantly thinking about new ways to make work, what's next. We're all still figuring it out. So there's no reason to feel too nervous about it. We're all in it together. Um, but sometimes you're gonna get no's, but maybe sometimes you're gonna get yeses and you're going to get to exhibit. So what does that look like? So likely there's some sort of um, formal, formal documentation process, either it's a letter of confirmation or um, a contract, a memorandum of understanding. That letter of confirmation is a useful thing for you to get because uh, you might want to use, um, you might want to use it to apply for exhibition assistance or a different type of grant, um, or just for your own peace of mind. Um, they're really nice things to have and to hold. Also organizations, institutions, we move slowly. We are planning two years or more in advance. Um, the Canada Council granting applications now are uh, four years out. So um, we, are submitting, um, we are submitting activities lists with schedules for, for four years. Um, I will say that within that four year schedule, that doesn't mean that there are not opportunities and flexibilities within that. Every gallery institution likely has um, spaces that are not um, what I would call maybe their anchor spaces. So at the Art Gallery of Peterborough, our main gallery is that anchor space and usually that is pretty locked in, but we also have um, conceptually four, uh, three uh, ramp galleries and those spaces, um, opportunities often pop up in there. Um, so being open to, to arising opportunities, uh, keeping, keeping an eye out for, um, for jury calls or um, themed, dream, themed group exhibition calls, um, those kinds of things are, are really great opportunities. And 
Okay, it begins a slow process of developing that show with the curator. No matter at what stage you're at when you submit, and if you're working with an institution and that show um, you perhaps even consider done, but it's scheduled for say three years from now, you're a, you're a, a live thinking artist that is probably going to change for you. And, uh, and I'm open to that. Um, so those things are, are all conversations. It is, it is not uncommon for artists to, um, keep working or keep thinking, make some changes. You know, there might be some solid, um, solid pillars that uh, that were already figured out that that stay the same when that show is presented to the public. But again, um, I think if we're all honest with with ourselves, uh, nothing ever feels done until it's out of the studio, right? Um, Okay, and then yeah, the gallery will, this institution will likely pay for shipping uh, at least one way. Um, we pay both ways. Um, we can also sometimes help with um, creating, uh, depending on depending on the, the nature of the show. Artists travel um, for when, whenever the artist needs to come. Um, so that, that might mean uh, multiple trips in the development of the exhibition or for events or for the installation, any of those kinds of things. Um, there will be artist fees. Um, we'll talk briefly about, about artist fees, but mostly I'll provide you a link and you probably already have, have it. Um, we're gonna do promotions and cover installation costs, vinyl, hardware, lighting. Um, and we might need to produce custom plinths if, if time and budget allows. Uh, it's good to start talking about those things early so that budget planning can happen. And, um, and if something needs time to be built uh, or produced, we've got that time to do it. So some things to remember in there, you're not gonna be driving the, the nature of the, of the promotions. You're not gonna be driving the nature of, of some of those things. Uh, so often those things are um, to a certain extent um, predetermined by um, the gallery's own branding or the gallery's own mechanisms. So that said, you will absolutely have um, have an opportunity to contribute and to talk about those things like what is the best image to uh, to present this work to the public or to entice this work, uh, the public to come and see this. Um, but yeah, there are some um, of those things that that will be kind of uh, that the that the institution is going to be in the driver's seat of. Um, again, hopefully you can see that as a benefit in instead of um, instead of a drawback. Uh, and make sure I've got documentation at the end there. So, so that might look like writing, that might look like great photography, that might look like a printed publication. Um, documentation, this is a great opportunity for you to document your work. Um, publications are, um, I don't know, they cost a lot of time and money, so they don't happen all the time. Um, we tend to do just one a year, um, maybe one and a half, depending on the scale uh, of that publication. Um, but yeah, uh, they're, they're really valuable. And even at the very least, if you don't get a printed publication, maybe you get um, a beautiful brochure or some excellent writing and great photo files that you can use. It's likely that the gallery feels very comfortable sharing the high quality um, documentation images with you uh, for your purposes, as long as you credit um, whoever paid for the photos, which would be the gallery and then the, the photographer. The gallery would provide you with that. So Carfac, um, Carfac has been uh, your advocate uh, in Canada since the 70s. And it is very likely that if you're to exhibit in a public institution that they are actually obligated to hit CARFAC minimums based on um, their funders requirements. So because we get Canada Council funding and Ontario Arts Council funding, we are, are happy 
to meet or exceed CARFAC minimums based on um, our category. So they have a bit of a, I don't know if I should call it a sliding scale, but um, different levels of minimums that, um, that uh, galleries have to hit based on what their annual operating budgets are. They've laid out all sorts of, um, all sorts of uh, recommendations for, um, for presentations, artist talks, um, exhibitions. Um, also, uh, they do a lot of work with, um, with copyright. Um, there are some guidelines for, um, for what you should get paid if that gallery wants to make posters and sell posters of your work. If you're if you're comfortable with that, you would you would definitely be able to say yes or no. But there are also some guidelines um, for what your fee structure might look like. So it's useful to check those things out. It's always good to know um, to to feel comfortable looking at checking out Carfac because um, it offers a, a lot of resources that you may or may not already have access to, um, and a lot of those resources are offered for free um, advice on. Uh, there's some advice on um, on contracts and um, selling your work, pricing your work, um, all, all sorts of different things. Obviously, there's more um, more access to those resources if you're a member, but they've got quite a bit of stuff online for free. And the institutions might have resources that you could access as well. Um, and you're already ahead of the game. You're in a great resource and a great, uh, a great, a great network here. You've got lots of supports, lots of resources. So good on you. Um, but yeah, check out Carfac. Um, it also, just like Akimbo, posts, uh, posts open calls. Um, Akimbo, you can sign up for free to get those. Um, emails. Um, it's, it is a bit Toronto centric, we can admit that, but, um, but we do post calls there. Um, and other places uh, definitely do as well. So it's not just postings about upcoming exhibitions, there are also uh, calls that you can get access to there, again, for free. Um, the Ontario Arts Council and the Canada Council, they do have grants. I mean, that's not the talk that we're doing, but um, once you've got that uh, letter of confirmation that you're going to have an exhibition, it's, it's possible that you're going to have a good case to get some exhibition assistance funding at the very least from Canada Council. Um, it's worth checking out exhibition assistance. I didn't put that link in the document, but I will, when I email Barb, I'll include that link. Um, just make a note for myself. Um, Pierre, have you ever gotten exhibition assistance before? It's okay, I won't put it on the spot. Um, Anyway, it's a it's a it's a low level access program, and it can support some of those sort of disposable costs that the gallery won't be able to cover. Um, they won't support. Uh, it's not a program for making work, but it is a program that can support framing. And um, if you've got any additional costs for packaging or shipping, if you need something specific, that the gallery can't provide for um, for installation. Um, those are the kinds of things that can support. And I think it's like up to $2,000 um, per year. Um, also, if it's a larger project, it might be that you want to go for some um, product development or research and creation uh, funding through either the Ontario Council, Arts Council or the Canada Council for the Arts. But don't forget your local arts funders if you're lucky enough to live in a city that has one. Um, and local arts councils, even if they don't have a funding structure, those are good places to get resources, meet people who live in your region, um, and find out opportunities. Also, workshops, gosh, you're here. Again, you're already ahead of the game. Um, if you're, uh, I've got down here studio labs and equipment sharing. Sometimes you want to try a new medium, but it's a lot of money to invest in something. There likely is, um, depending on where you live, um, an organization that is sort of medium specific that has uh, that has a bunch of equipment in a media lab or a studio lab 
that can offer access to members and also probably also, probably also does uh, workshops. Um, artist talks and events, always great things to go to, volunteer opportunities. Oh yeah. And if you ever get the chance to sit on a jury, take it because the best way to understand what, um, what it looks like or the best way to understand how to write a good application is to read through other people's applications from the perspective of a jury member. So um, sometimes I would say it would be useful uh, if you get the opportunity, um, even if that excludes you from being a part of a show or a thing that you um, like to be a part of, it, it might be valuable enough to, uh, to get an opportunity to sit on that jury. Invaluable experience. Um, last thoughts. Yeah, don't forget your name and contact information. It does get forgotten the way that I've made my forms now. You can't get away with, um, with submitting without, without including that because, yeah, I've gotten interesting submissions before that just I had no way of contacting anybody. Read the call, follow the requirements. Again, that documentation, uh, that any information on the documentation lists or um, documentation file formats, those kinds of things, really pay attention to those. Um, check out the gallery's mission and mandate. But really, I mean, those are going to be quite general and for the most part, say the same kinds of things and check out their past and current exhibitions. Also, when you're looking at their past exhibitions, ask yourself or try and find out if they've recently had a change of stuff. Because if they've recently had a change of stuff, then maybe that past uh, set of exhibitions isn't telling you enough about, uh, about the current curatorial um, brain that's at that space. If you can visit the gallery, um, get a sense of that, of that space. It might, be, <laughs> might tell you that you don't want to show there. It, it might tell you that you're really excited to show there. Um, but yeah, actually seeing the space, really, really valuable. Um, talk to the staff, especially if you're in the region. And I mean all the staff, um, especially at small institutions. We are all doing, um, we've all got our fingers in all, in all the pots. And, um, and yeah, we all talk. It, it's useful. Go to openings, involve yourself in space. Be eager, never entitled, but really, I don't think you guys are going to be. Go for sleek, simple formatting choices. Uh, we won't take you as seriously if your proposal is written in 16 point comic sans. I have gotten those. It's not great for you. Um, be focused and clear. And remember that things take time. Long consideration periods are really typical. Um, again, to reiterate though, don't feel like you can't reach out. It's, it's really worthwhile to just check in and be like, hey, haven't heard from you in a while. Um, even if maybe you wanna update your submission, maybe you wanna go like, gosh, my thoughts on this whole thing have changed since. Can you get rid of that one and take this one instead? Also super useful. There might be other factors delaying those decisions. Obviously COVID has thrown all of us for a loop, but we're getting back on track. I don't think I have any more slides. Oh yeah, sorry, just Andy Clover. Um, we're all continually trying to do better than we did before. Um, so be generous with yourself. We're all just people. Um, yeah. I hope that I hope I hope that was helpful. Again, uh, really happy to take any questions, um, feedback of any kind, um, and also in the PDF, I should note that I included my email address as well. So if you think of something later, you can ask. Are there any questions? I did not see any questions in the chat box. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. Or if you, you know, feel mm. more comfortable typing it in the chat box, I can read it out as well. Typical time frame to wait. <laughs> I am gonna say like right now, it's like a it's like it's like really sad, but like a year. Um, so typical time frame to wait before checking in, hmm, three months. Check in. Really happy to have a check-in. Maybe it gives me an opportunity to, to meet you. 
in a different way. Maybe it, um, maybe it means that I'm going to go check out your, your submission, um, that day. Um, but yeah, right now, right now it's really painful. Um, yeah, um, but we do have an upcoming call, open call for submissions uh, for, for a specific show. So there is that. How many pieces are you typically looking for in a submission? Mm, that's great. Okay, so um, usually, like it's not uncommon for, um, for a gallery or an institution to invite about 15 to 20 uh, pieces of documentation. So um, what that might boil down to is like 10 pieces, right? Um, 10 pieces that, that also are um, supported with a bit of uh, detail. Um, perhaps you're only needing to support a few of those pieces with detail. Um, but yeah, 10, 10, 12, that's enough. Um, Totally understanding though that that's not going to be if it if you're applying for a solo show that might not be the full extent of what's in the show but that's okay because all the submission process is for is to get you to the point where I'm even saying like hey I'm interested it might not even be that the submission process is set up to be like yes or no right it might just be that it's like oh strong maybe let's do a studio visit um, so that's that's uh, that's a good good. Thing to keep in mind um, and a good reason to keep in mind that like what you, the intention of the submission is to be um, focused and clear to tell me what I need to know to get you to that next step. Does that make sense? Oh, um, um, including in, in your submission whether or not you're open to be um, curated into a group exhibition, that's useful. <laughs> Um, so I have a question. I, I'm curious when you're talking about sending submissions. So you're saying that um, an artist can just put together a proposal and send an email to the gallery and with the proposal of what kind of show they want, a solo show, without any kind of you know connection beforehand? Yeah, so it depends on the space. Um, some spaces absolutely invite that. Um, we have an open, an ongoing, all the time open call for submissions, but it is through um, it is through an online portal. Uh, it's I don't think it's too hard to get into, and all of our staff have ha have gone through the process. So if you're having trouble with our online portal, and I will, I'll just make a note. I'll include our link to that, but. But again, like for any institution, check out their websites because they they might, they don't all, but they might have uh, an open call for submissions format. It might be that they just want you to send them an email. It might be that they want you to send an email to a specific web, to a specific email address and not to the curator, but maybe it's like a submissions at, blah, 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 blah. I don't know. Um, and the other thing that I can tell you, uh, is that we do, I mean, I do also just get, um, people put me on uh, their email lists for, for show announcements. It's not as effective, um, but once we have a relationship, uh, that's where that, that kind of thing can, can come in. Um, but yeah, I, I'm serious. There are a bunch of galleries that are really open to just receiving cold emails. So Finn, I guess that was one of the questions uh, if there's nothing on the website about submitting, should I assume they are not open or try anyways? And Pick up then, the phone. Okay. Yeah, call, ask. And then the second question was about how are submissions from more than one artist viewed, like a group of three to four people together around a theme as an example? Yep, totally. Um, so same thing, I think, I think that our, um, hmm, I should look at it again, I think, anyway. Yes, you can absolutely submit um, for group exhibitions. If you're finding that uh, the format feels clunky for that, just shoot me an email or shoot the gallery an email um, to say, hey, I'm interested in submitting for a group exhibition. I've got four artists that we're working together. Um, yeah, that can that can be that can be really useful and uh, can be really interesting. Um, sometimes, 
it's um, sometimes because it's a bit more specific, it might be less easy to find the right curator for it because really a lot of those curatorial decisions have already been made if you've if you've got that group exhibition pulled together. But that said, um, I've absolutely received um, exhibition submissions from um, from groups of artists that I've said yes to. Uh, next question is, can you submit exhibiting a show you have already exhibited if it includes new work? Oh, yeah, I, I think one of the main like problems of our art world is that we're like so obsessed with new stuff like it's probably like our obsession with new stuff is probably why the whole world is falling apart so why do we want to do that only and why do we want to do that to ourselves as artists as well um just because you've shown work doesn't mean it's done um and sometimes an institution doesn't have the capacity to tour your show um, so then you need to do that yourself. I know that um, artists who have shown work at our institution that we couldn't tour because of the scale of it or the context of what we were doing at the time have taken that work without adding new stuff even and shown it at other spaces. What gets tricky is if, uh, is if the didactic material and all of those things be have become the intellectual property of the um, of the initial institution. So then you just have to sort of like think about that. It's good, it's good to have a conversation with that initial institution. And that's really what ended up happening for us. And it was just like, gosh, yeah, your show, you this work should be showing at other places, but we can't do that. If you can get it there and you can have a, a, a conversation with that curator and you guys can figure out how to position your show in their space, go for it. Okay. Anybody else? You've got a what? What about two D works? I'm not sure what you mean. Did someone? Oh, it's a direct 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 me. message to you. Okay, <laughs> I don't see it in the chat. Box. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um. Okay, so Louise Lewis, I'm so I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um. What about 2D works? I'm not entirely sure what you mean, aside from, um, yeah, I love 2D works. Pierre does 2D works and they're coming into the space. Um, different spaces. Uh, I mean, one of the things that, that I do as um, an institutional curator, which I don't have to do as a freelance curator, um, one of the things I'm obligated to do is think about uh, the full, um, breadth of our exhibition schedule and make sure that we've got a variety of things going on in there. Um, but that means a variety of things. So absolutely 2D work fits in there. I hope that, I hope that addressed your question. Okay, anyone else? So we're coming up to almost 8.30, which is what, you know, the session is scheduled for. So if there aren't any other questions, then um, on behalf of, uh, oh, will the PDF be sent to everyone who, it, yes. <laughs> yes, we will definitely get that all out. Um, so if there isn't any, uh, for, uh, aren't any further questions now, or if you think of something later, you can always um, email us. Um, but on behalf of you know, the Artist Network, we wanna thank uh, Finn for, for her time and for sharing her knowledge. Uh, it um, was an awesome session. So uh, we look forward to, to studying the PDF. And as a reminder to everyone, there are uh, two shows happening. Obviously, Art Walk in the Square is starting on Friday. In-person happens this weekend. And the online obviously starts Friday and runs until October 1st. Uh, also, we have um, sister artists, Kate Taylor and Helen Utsal working independently and together on artworks uh, in a new exhibition called the Family Garden uh, Converging Harmonies. And so that started at Leslie Grove uh, this evening. So check both of those out, of course. And if we have nothing else, I wish everyone a good evening and thank you very much. Thank you, Finn. Thanks Bye, everyone. Good night. Thank you very much. Have a good night.